Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Gibson Carner, and I am the treasurer for the Colorado State University student chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects. I am very excited to welcome you all to the third day of our 28th annual Landscape Architecture Day Lecture Series, or LA Days. Before we begin, I would like to give a sincere thanks to all of our donors, ASCSU, the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture, CSU's College of Agricultural Sciences Ag Council, and the Colorado chapter of ASLA. Without their support, we would not be able to put together such an exciting lecture series for you all. Today, we have the honor of being joined by the esteemed Lori Oland. At the end of his presentation today, we will, we will be conducting a Q&A with him. If you have any questions throughout his presentation, please put them in the Q&A section of this meeting, as he will not be using the chat feature for questions. Without further ado, I will pass things on to Annie Irwin to further welcome our speaker, Lori Olin. Thank you. For many of you, Lori Olin needs no introduction, but for any of you that need a refresher, Lori is a distinguished teacher, author, and one of the most renowned landscape architects practicing today. From vision to realization, he guided many of Olin's signature projects, including the Washington Monument Grounds in Washington, D.C. Bryant Park in New York City and the Getty Center in Los Angeles. His recent projects include the award-winning Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Apple Park in Cupertino. Lori studied civil engineering at the University of Alaska and architecture at the University of Washington. He is currently Emeritus Professor of Landscape Architecture and of Landscape Architecture at Harvard University. Lori is a fellow of the American uh, Academy of Arts and Letters, a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects, and a recipient of the 2012 National Medal of Arts, the Vincent Scully Prize from the National Building Museum. And now please join me in welcoming Lori Olin. Laura, you're still muted. Hi, I was saying good evening to everybody. Can you hear me now? Yep, I'll yes, get it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Well, uh, it's not advancing. What's going on in your screen sharing? Hmm. There we go. Okay, I got it. I'm, I'm operating. <laughs> Okay, so drawing is one of man's oldest cultural achievements. And along with music, it began at least 35,000 years ago, long before any written language. While there's a debate regarding the meaning and purpose of remarkable drawings such as these in a cave at the Dordogne in France, there is no question about their superb draftsmanship and the intense observation and the accuracy and the life in them. Well, from that time, until the present, almost everybody draws in their early years. And the nature of their drawing is remarkably similar and powerful in its presentation of the world and imagination. But in most societies today, however, nearly everyone stops drawing sometime early in elementary school, in large part because there seems to be no utility for it, unlike speech and other skills. This was true long before the development of computers and digital media. Some few continue to draw, however, but mostly people who are interested, whoops, excuse me, most, damn it. How do I go back? Here we go. That's what we want. Um, few continue to draw, but mostly people who are interested in art or design. There's a long history of drawing and representation of Western society. And this is a drawing by Claude Lorrain, one of the artists who developed plein air drawing and painting directly from nature. This ink and wash drawing was made about 1640 in the Vigna Madama, a Medici property that was just north of the Vatican in Rome. Now, drawing has been utilized by many individuals who are interested in analytical study of all sorts for centuries. Here you can see anatomy studies by Leonardo da Vinci from the 15th century. Drawing is still employed for all manner of identification and is often preferred even in medicine today as being more clear and more useful than photography. 
Recent articles have also remarked upon the fact that medical schools such as Harvard and Drexel University recently have begun offering drawing courses to their medical students as a means of helping them to become more observant, literally to be able to see more carefully than people who don't draw. Which brings up the notion that sketching and drawing is a way of seeing and of knowing, of slowing oneself down long enough to perceive something carefully, to analyze and think about it, literally of being there. These are a couple of pages from a sketchbook of the great 19th century painter, Eugene Delacroix, from a trip that he took to North Africa that changed his life and art, leading to some of his most remarkable paintings afterward. Here on the left is one of those sketches that he later used for this recumbent woman you see in the famous painting, The Demoiselle d'Alger, that's now in the Louvre in Paris. So the habit of artists to use quick sketches, these inexpensive things, these drawings on paper as preliminary studies and tests for larger, more time-consuming and ambitious works is so familiar that we don't think much about it. There are at least a dozen other such Conte crayons by Seurat for this very famous painting of the Sunday crowd on the Grand Jatte that's now in the Art Institute in Chicago. Even some of the most radical and modern of the artists of the 20th century have kept sketchbooks of record uh, to record things and to develop ideas, as well as to make notes when they're studying the work of other artists who they admire. These are examples of some of Picasso's many sketchbooks. On the left, we see him trying out ideas for a painting. One of them on the far left there is his interpretation of a woman from that very same Delacroix painting we just saw. And next to it, holding the sketchbook turned the other way, he made a sketch study for a painting of his own studio. The other two pages on the right from another one of his sketchbooks show him doodling around with motifs that are a combination that are partially furniture, vases, a torso, various abstractions. Well, on the right, he's looking very carefully at a Rembrandt portrait of a man in a helmet. Well, drawings in the form of illustrations for texts, such as those for religious items like the Bible, have existed since the end of the Roman Empire. And they continued into the era of novelistic fiction of Dickens and Thackeray, illustrations of Shakespeare and Goethe's plays, as well as journalistic accounts of various events. Winslow Homer, the later very famous for being a painter, submitted drawings to Eastern newspapers and journals during the Civil War. And with the birth of film and early animation and the productions of Walt Disney and others, drawings became the vehicle for the narrative displacing text. Here, are one of, here is one of John Tenniel's 19th century wonderful illustrations from Alice in Wonderland of the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. And on the right, you see drawings, original studies, and then from the film, of the Sorcerer's Apprentice portion of Disney's first full-length animated feature film from 1938, Fantasia. Now, the Disney Studios pioneered the notion of creating images through a series of overlays with different visual information, as in the scene here from Bambi, which could then be photographed as a composite image, anticipating the overlay techniques later that were applied in landscape architecture and planning and analysis that finally found their way into computer applications and eventually into architecture. Even today, however, despite recent developments in digital technology and software, the folks over at Pixar, who are arguably one of the most advanced commercial animation studios in the world, they always begin and develop their work through drawing. Examples of these you see here are preparatory sketches and some storyboard drawings that led to the digitally animated feature film Ratatouille a few years back. And here, for example, are some of the storyboard setups for the Studio Ghibli in Japan, one of the most famous of all the anime films ever, Princess Mononoke. It's an example of the indispensable nature of the ability to draw from one's imagination, you know, how it continues to be useful despite all of the digital and computational tools that we have at our disposal. So how about architecture? Well, Again, there's a very long tradition of drawing. We often think of the use of measured plans and sections as a near magical product of the Italian Renaissance, as in this plan on the left by Antonio Sangallo the Younger for the Palazzo Farnese up in Caprarola, north of Rome. But in fact, <laughs> the use of measured drawings for the design and construction of buildings is much, much older. Here is a scale drawing 
of an elevation of a lintel on columns framing a doorway of a temple made in ink on papyrus in the eighth dynasty of Egypt. Look really carefully and you can see the shape and the moldings of the doorway with the attached capitals and the lintel with the proposed carved ornament of the sun in the center right there, if you really study this drawing. This is a pretty old architectural drawing. Problem here, technical problem. So it's true, however, that by the 16th century, most of the conventions that we still employ for describing buildings and three-dimensional spaces and structures had been developed. These are two studies of the fabric of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. It's a partial plan as below of the central apse and the attendant piers of the crossing that support the dome. And then seen in the cutaway perspective above, you can see the same, the same material in the same place, just drawn in another way. These are both by Baldassare Peruzzi. So not only were measured plans used to construct models and then from them buildings, but also it was with freehand drawings that these architects developed their ideas for all the aspects of their structures. They used sections and elevations, plans, perspective, sketches, imagining particular intersections and working out the relationships of the parts, the structural systems, the geometry, even the ornament. Now conventions of representation developed that became a universal means of description and communication entered other fields. This is a drawing by the great 17th century landscape architect André Lenotre from one of the fountain basins in Versailles in France. It combines a partial plan with the vertical axonometric view of the basin and the surrounding hedges and the vegetation. But there's also a cross section explaining the structure of the walls, the foundations and the grading. It's both a presentation drawing meant to impress and persuade his client, Louis XIV to build it, but also it's used to explain the work to his assistants and to the construction team. Such technique was utilized throughout Europe and by the late 17th century, a profoundly influential institution, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts was established in Paris to assure the crown and its bureaucracy and institutions of a steady supply of trained architects, engineers, artists, and decorators. Several significant methods were developed in this school that entered the field of architecture. These were the atelier system of study, wherein a student would spend several years under a prominent designer, assisting them in their work while studying the history, techniques, and elements of architecture. Also, they, they learned to make presentations of project plans to the jury of academicians. And this led to more advanced students finally loading cart their boards onto the small carts, which were called charrettes, with the help of the junior students and assistants and rushing them to the courtyard of the Ecole to beat the submission deadline. And the establishment of prizes, of course, came out of the same moment. The most prestigious one of being the Prix de Rome, which sent a student off to live and to work at the Villa Medici in Rome for three years, after which they would return to France to enter practice and embark upon a career. A principal feature of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts pedagogy was the esquisse, or the sketch problem. Two examples of those are shown here. These are timed exercises with a problem handed out to be due in a brief period of time, say one or one day or 12 hours. Or in the case of my own classmates and I, a second and a half later, 10 hours. They were handed out to us at noon and we had until 10 p.m. The object was to analyze a program quickly, decide upon a scheme, develop it and then present it in a plan, section and elevation, fully rendered with no verbal description. It was intended to train one to produce synthetic works that had a strong concept and a very clear formal idea, wherein all the parts were harmonious and coherent and in support of the party. Students were graded for the concept, for the development and for the presentation. Impressive to us today are the superb watercolor renderings that were produced on heavy watercolor paper. Their sheer size and their technical mastery is very impressive. We should also note carefully, however, the nature of the architectural ideas and the strategies that are expressed in rendering such as this. The sequence of spaces, their size and pacing from small to medium and large, and the articulation of the volumes, their purpose and their placement, all of which were fundamental architectural theory of their day part of which was the march, 
the marsh, the, the route taken through a work of architecture and the hierarchy of spaces that one encountered with the smaller ones subservient to the most important, usually the larger and more central ones. Such ideas and techniques didn't disappear in the modern era, but were transformed and repurposed for a different society with new compositional ideas, materials, and media. This is a large presentation drawing, a dramatic perspective in colored pencil on vellum by Frank Lloyd Wright himself for the Kaufman family summer retreat known as Falling Water at Bear Run in Pennsylvania. Well, no one thinks of Frank Lloyd Wright as a Beaux-Arts architect. He thoroughly employed such strategies in his working methods, which he'd picked up from his master, his own master, Louis Sullivan, who had studied in Paris at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And here's a sheet of Wright's drawings that I particularly admire because it exemplifies such practice. It's of the Millard House in Pasadena. Clearly it was done in one sitting. In the center of the drawing is the plan. You know, it's clearly the first thing that got done. And then next to it, he then immediately dropped some lines down from the plan and he created an elevation that's drawn over a cross section of the site. And from that off to the right, he then pulls out the side elevation, which then he makes notes about and studies the massive up above, just above that of the twin piers on each side of the central volume. On the, over on the left side of the sheet near the middle is a study of the concrete block system that he's thinking about using quite a remarkable Mesoamerican inspired tapestry brickwork that characterizes the integral ornament found in a series of buildings of his of that period. It's an inspired example of the esquisse method of study and composition, clearly all done in one day at one sitting. This straightforward orthogonal projection method has been used extensively to study, describe and instruct for centuries now and it's not limited just to architects, but it's also employed by engineers and industrial designers who utilize the same devices of plan, section, and elevation. These are studies by Joseph Hoffman, the great Viennese architect who also designed furniture, fabrics, and utilitarian objects. They're of a coffee pot on the left and a soup spoon on the right. Note how for the coffee pot, he's made several cross sections, one of the body of the pot two of the curved handle, one at the bottom and one near the top. And then he's done one of the shape of the end of the spout you can see up there. And then he did a plan of the knob up on top. You see above it and see how they're all similar, they, which gives a harmony to their parts. Likewise, the same plan section and elevation for a spoon. <laughs> well, the cliche that travel broadens the mind is based upon several truths. It's true. <laughs> First, because we learn from seeing. It's helpful for those who wish to design things to see as much of what has been done already by other people in other places as possible, in part to assess things that have worked well or not, and to broaden their visual and artistic knowledge and vocabulary. If the Grand Tour was considered educational and a nice thing for the middle and upper classes, it was considered essential for artists and architects who often recorded their travels and their observations in sketchbooks. This has been as true of modern architects as it is of those in modern in earlier eras. And in recent years, numerous publications of facsimiles of designer sketchbooks have begun to appear fairly regularly as in this example about Le Corbusier. As a, well, let's stick with that. As a young architect, Le, Cour Le Corbusier took several trips to see famous archeological and architectural sites in the Mediterranean, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, recording what he saw and what he thought in several sketchbooks that have been reproduced in facsimile. Here we see some of his impressions of the Acropolis, of course, with the Parthenon, and then that small temple of Nike on the right by the Propylia. And in the center, we've in a couple of other pages where there is a perspective sketch and a plan of the central forum in Pompeii, along with some of his notes about it. These are other studies of his from a different sketchbook that he took on an earlier trip to Germany and the Netherlands while he was still a student. Corbu pays careful attention to color 
and to its relationship to form and decoration in this one, as well as to details that caught his attention, such as a mechanism for a movable panel. You can see the wheel over there that things move on, its track, the fabrication, and the metal fastenings. Well, several years later, in a series of projects from 1925 on, we can see him using drawing as the means to study and to think about his designs, as well as to present his work to his clients. Colors he'd absorbed while traveling are invoked in this early uh, drawing from his white prismatic period when he did the Villa Garsh and the Villa Stein, the Villa Savoy and those projects. Among the greatest modern architects, many have made journeys to see and study these sites, these designs, which have been recorded over the years and years and sent in sketches. On the left are two pages from a sketchbook by the architect Alvar Alto looking down on the theater and temple of Apollo while he was visiting Delphi in Greece. The measured detail up above on the right of, a, of the stone seats is from a theater of Dionysus in Athens and the fig tree sketch, the word olive is about something else because that's clearly a fig. <laughs> the fig tree sketch made in Egypt shows his interest in form and the relationship of various shapes and curves. Now Alto, like so many superb designers throughout history, likewise made countless design studies exploring ideas and forms, structures and reflexive gestures, such as he had noticed and recorded in his sketching. Quickly and deftly, he put down one idea after another and then immediately develops them into a series of variations. Here you see studies for the plan of a church with chapels, and then in a series of very quick cross-sectional sketches things that lead to further studies and finally to the actual documentation and the construction drawings below. Another great designer of the recent past was the Italian Carlo Scarpa, who designed furniture, glass, fabrics, gardens, and buildings. I even own a couple of lovely knit ties of his design that I bought in Rome. He was a wonderful architect and a superb draftsman. Here we see two of his many studies for the Brion family tomb near Venice, employing the ancient convention of studying architecture and plan and section simultaneously with, with one drawing above the other as we saw in Frank Lloyd Wright's work. In this case, it's of an arching bridge shape that springs over a basin with an island and some sculptural elements. The drawing on the right side combines some plans, sections, elevations and details of this very place uh, they're all worked on clearly all at the same time at the same sitting. Again, simple drawings with colored pencils on tracing paper. One can see him feeling his way, only drawing the next thing as, that he's interested in. One of Scarpa's masterpieces is a museum that he developed within Castelvecchio in Verona, where he made a series of interventions within the shell of a historic structure that play off and against it, emphasizing its qualities while highlighting particular works of art in dramatic and confrontational manner, such as this early Renaissance sculpture of an armor clad figure thrust out from a bomb damaged missing portion of the building fabric. And here we can see his earliest concept sketches for this very element. Look at how he uses a soft pencil to develop the idea for the L-shaped concrete support, exploring whether it should take the shape of a bent structural T or as he eventually settled on it, an inverted U or channel shape the pier then turns 90 degrees into a cantilever bracket. Note in carefully in the, the upper left there, the inclusion of a scale human figure and her line of sight toward the installation. He's using the drawing to determine what you would be able to see from which position. Another example of all this is Lou Kahn, one of America's greatest architects of the late 20th century. While he was teaching at Yale and prior to his returning to Rome, to Philadelphia rather to teach and practice for the rest of his career. He spent Phil in the American Academy in Rome. And he, he took a life changing trip to Greece and Egypt with two superb classical scholars who happened to be there, William MacDonald and Frank Brown. A staunch modernist, Khan, you know, found on, on this trip, exciting vision of primal forms of light stunning compositions and sequences, which he recorded in a number of drawings and sketches. Later in Lou's sketchbooks, sketchbooks, they're really 
cheap, inexpensive, convenient, lightweight, portable things. We see him working out ideas for numerous projects in pen and ink. Here are examples for volumes and forms, structures of various projects, whether for government or religious worship or re residential structures. In, in this particular example, this was the mikveh synagogue to be built here in Philadelphia. Khan and his staff, like many other architects, built many, many models at all sorts of scales for study and for presentation. But he also employed drawing extensively as a fundamental medium from his earliest thoughts and explorations, creating study after study in charcoal on tracing paper in pencil and, and, and chalk. And then later came the hard line drawings and finally the construction documents. These happen to be drawings for Sock Center and a residential complex that he proposed to have there. Eventually, all the drawings for Sock were recorded in these very tight ink drawings that are very beautiful of their own sort. Now for Kahn, who was trained in the Beaux-Arts manner under Paul Philippe Cray at Penn, despite his embrace for, of modernism, his retention of the study methods and the use of soft colored pencils, charcoal and pastel on tracing paper allowed him to work on one sketch over another and to change, to smudge, to overlay, emphasize and seemingly pull form and light out of the surface into a physical presence as in these drawings for the Roosevelt Memorial in the East River in New York. Drawings that are as dreamy as they are powerful and evocative. The number of modern designers who continued to find drawing as a media for personal discovery and development is great. A few years ago, Michael Graves, who along with Charles Moore and Robert Venturi is credited with launching postmodernism, published a number of the drawings and sketches he made while at the American Academy in Rome and on his travels as a young designer prior to his career of teaching at Princeton and developing a world famous reputation and practice. A recent graduate, of the University of Cincinnati's College of Design, Art and Planning. Here he is in Rome as a young man, giving himself an education that cannot be obtained from slides and pictures and books by making his own recordings that included visits to modern masterpieces as well, such as the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, which you can see in this nice loose study on the right. This is not something just for architects and painters. A number of landscape architects likewise have kept sketchbooks and employed drawing extensively as well. This includes one of the most seminal figures in landscape architecture of recent times. Lawrence Halprin, seen here in a sketch I made of him at Harvard one year on the left. On the left, oh, that's him up in there on the right, buried under, partially under me. But on the, up on the upper left is a sketch that Larry made while he was serving in the Navy in the South Pacific in World War II. The aerial drawing uh, that you see below, he made of his own house in Marin County a number of years later. Now, Larry drew constantly and in a number of ways experimenting with representation. On the left is a drawing of the early McIntyre garden combines a straightforward plan of the walled garden, kind of like the Lenotra drawing you saw uh, with his fountains and his pinwheeling runnels with a somewhat aerial perspective a, almost a orthogonal, you know, the projection vertically, just as we saw earlier. Um, and then finally, you can see a distant perspective as he looks off what you would see look out from that terrace, all combined into one drawing. There's the meadow, the tree, the Oakland Hills. On the right is a frequently reproduced concept sketch of his from one of his sketchbooks for the famous Sea Ranch development. It shows his ability to synthesize experience from walking around on the ground and then making a simple aerial perspective that he then annotates to explain the organizing principles that he's proposing. Larry's last office in San Francisco was clearly an artist's studio as much as it was a landscape architect's professional workplace where it was clear that there were facilities for drawing and painting as well as drafting, writing, computing and making models. After a number of years in private practice and while he was still young, Halperin traveled to Europe, the Mediterranean and to Israel. It was a life-changing trip for him in no small part because he took the time to slow down and despite taking hundreds of photographs, some of which he published several books later, he, he looked long and carefully at the things he visited and he made drawings, careful drawings in his sketchbooks. Like that last slide of the Fountain of Trevi, these drawings 
made at the Villa d'Este. They're intense and they're careful studies, great hydraulic works of art. Studies of how they were made, forms, their dimensions, how things work. Subsequently to that, he took his sketchbooks on numerous trips up into the Sierras on the trails in the Yosemite. There he recorded intense observations of the rocks, you know, the water, the movement, the landforms with pen, ink, and brush. You're undoubtedly aware that he soon thereafter produced a series of public spaces and fountains, such as his influential one, Ira's Fountain in Portland, Oregon, that Ada Louise Huxtable, the architecture critic for the New York Times, declared to be among the very best and most innovative public spaces since the Renaissance. So too, as with the past and with others, I am a proponent of hand drawing and the utility of sketchbooks as a means of self-education, of discovery and pleasure. These are among the 770 sketchbooks that I've filled over the years. They are, as you see, of various manufacture, various sizes, shapes, bound in various ways and containing different paper. Possibly the most important aspect of drawing for me, and I think for most people, is that it forces you to see. You have to look carefully at something in order to draw it. In the act of looking closely, one learns things. This study of the heron fishing in a freshwater pond that I made in 1968 was done with a graphite pencil and a sketchbook on clay-coated paper, which I'd found, which I thought was really interesting. This interest in the natural world around me and a desire to teach myself to draw better led me to this study in pen and ink on Bainbridge Island a year later as part of a series of mushroom and stump drawings that I made in 1969 and then went on into 1970. Many of these that I made, I did with a rapidograph as it was a drafting pen and ink on rice paper. Training the eye to see carefully and to be able to record what it sees in drawings like this requires time and requires patience, steady concentration and care, all the things that are needed in design. In making the drawings that appear in Across the Open Field, my book on the English landscape, you can see that I wasn't merely interested in views or scenes. I was also recording structure and recurring patterns evident in different places and materials at different scales different harmonies, as well as contrast in form and detail at different depths. Drawings helped me to sit there and think and stare and think some more about what I was looking at. I'm advocating learning by doing, learning by seeing. You must go see things for yourself. You could lose your camera for a time. On several trips of my own to see and study greatly admired sites and design icons while drawing, I noted their color, their form, their structure, the spatial arrangements and materials, dimensions and construction details. This is information not gained while snapping a lot of photographs or surfing the web for potted history and images. There is no way that taking photographs, whether with high quality camera or one of today's remarkable phones could have taught me as much as doing this sketch and making these notes in Greece. Pointing and shooting, turning away and going on to the next set of hasty images will never inform the brain the way making this sketch did for me. One of the nice things about sketchbooks is that they are so flexible for recording information of all sorts. Here I noted the plan and the principal features of the Campo Santa Maria Formosa in Venice, along with notations and pedestrian circulation, there's about the diverse activities and the life of the place. One year, when I was taking a break from architecture before I went off to seriously study landscape architecture, I spent several months on Skid Road in Seattle, quietly studying the community of homeless and impoverished people who lived there. Eventually, I published a slim book on the subject. Drawing proved to be a good way to spend time there and to be accepted from the folks on the Skid Road while recording a lot of detail and valuable material. One day I showed up with a camera and it wasn't tolerated. I was almost attacked. I didn't come back with a camera again. It was in sitting still and looking about and listening carefully that I learned so much. So much travel today is only tourism, people moving too fast, taking hundreds of useless images. 
it's no substitute for what happens when one stops and spends the time to make a drawing. Most architects today know of Piazza San Marco in Venice, but have they taken the time to study the ratio of the height to width of the Piazzetta or of stopping in Arezzo and really examining the great arcaded building by Varsari that brings order to what is otherwise a cockeyed jumble of sloping pavement and disparate buildings or how that structure restates the loggia he executed at the Uffizi Gallery in Florence for the Medici and the relationship of both of them to Brunelleschi's Fondling Hospital design at the Piazza Santa Maria Annunziata. None of this I would have thought of if I hadn't taken the time to make this drawing. Due to my lack of training in horticulture or botany, I've had to learn about plants on my own while getting on with life. One big help has been to look at things on my own, study and record them while out in the world, and to make careful drawings and then key the plants out later. As in this upper sketchbook from a time spent in the Sierras at, near Yosemite, or as in the lower sketch of succulents that I made in a garden in Yuma, Arizona. Here are some sketchbooks from different trips that I took to France. When I find something I like, I really want to absorb it. I try to take an opportunity, make an opportunity to draw it. And while I have never, never copied any of these things and places consciously in my work, they, they, they deeply inform my work. They, they have influenced my work. Drawings can be more analytical than most people realize. This is an example concerns the Fountain of Four Rivers by Bernini in the Piazza Navona in Rome. I began the drawing with the base of the obelisk and its figures, noting the difference in scale between them and the crowd of visitors. Look at those tiny little people along the bottom. And then I did another drawing on the right, just off to the right and what was left of the page, showing more clearly the gesture of the pyramidal base with the carved void beneath the weight of the obelisk. I have a show off on Bernini's part. And then I did an even smaller drawing of how it was made from a stack of blocks that you see just above the left there. <laughs> and then finally, oh, no, it's under my photograph, oh dear. Finally, I made a little tiny doodle of the twist, the torque of the whole ensemble explaining it. notes in the field, measurements, produced a survey, and then drew it up for publication in a monograph on the villa that was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. The plan was made, it's a fairly large drawing, with Prismacolor pencils on mylar, and the sections are colored pencil and sepia wash in a large horizontal or what you'd call landscape format sketchbook. One result of the drawing, <clears throat> one result of drawing with such purpose is that while I was practicing and teaching all the time, I was continuously learning and adding to what I could bring to my work and could share with others, with my students, with my colleagues, with the public. So now I'd like to share some examples and thoughts regarding drawing as it's been employed in the practice of my own office over the last 40 years. Here we can see partners at work. <laughs> Um, on the left are Bob Hanna and myself. We're out in the field in Taroko Gorge in Taiwan on the East Coast there, working on the concept plan for a, national, a new national park. And on the right, you can see Halle Boyce, one of our partners on a site in West Philadelphia. And what are we doing? We're making field observations in the form of drawings with notes, just as you've been seeing, of course. When invited to make a design for Columbus Circle in New York, the first thing I did was go to the site and spend time trying to understand just what it was, its parts, its functions and conditions, what the issues were. Only then could I begin to make some notes about it in the context of the city as one approached it from the south, from the north, from the east. After which I could begin to speculate about ideas for a new scheme that might work in different ways and accommodate specific movement and certain aesthetic qualities that interested me. Likewise, after some 
early freehand sketches, a wealth of carefully drafted studies, drawings of varying character were produced for all the different components, the fountains, the paving, the planting, the furnishing and so on. Needless to say, there was a lot of stuff going on. A lot of technical issues had to be dealt with that weren't visible, such as the below grade transit stations for two overlapping and intersecting subway lines and a great deal of utilities under the streets, along with a set of precise dimensions. We had to figure it all out. And the only way to do it, the only way to record it and to understand it was by drawing it all. But there is no question that the early drawings in the sketchbook the thinking and the imagining that one is capable of achieving with such simple, flexible tools set the entire project and its design proposal and a solution in motion. One other project that you probably know about is the J. Paul Getty Center in Los Angeles where Richard Meyer was the architect. Now he'd been working on the project for some time when we were called in to help, which isn't the best of all worlds, but it's what we had. And he asked us to take over the site design. I flew out, I went to the site, I visited his office and I went to a model shop that he'd set up. And this is a sketch I made of a large wooden model that was underway of the ensemble of buildings with their proposed levels. Again, I made a number of sketches to help me understand the relationships and what was going on. And, you know, and these drawings were far more analytical and helpful than the Sula photographs or I could have possibly taken at the time. We developed a number, whoops, skip something. I guess that's all right. We developed a number of studies in a short period of time of various gardens, a number of which are seen here in one of our early presentations to the Getty. And as you can see, they're simply colored pencil drawings on tracing paper, nothing too fancy, but very clear at a scale that the owner and the architect could see well and understand. Now, just before, we were to fly out to LA to make this presentation, I realized that the audience might find the wealth of material to be a lot to take all at once, that we had too much of it in our heads. There were so many parts and different pieces in the scheme and that I'd have to find a way to explain the underlying overall concept. So I grabbed a copy of Shepard Angelica's pre-war monograph, Italian Garden, and threw it in my bag with my sketchbook on the way out the door to the airport. On the plane, I asked a for a glass of water, opened my sketchbook, and I made this drawing. The upper cross section is a version of their Shepherd and Bellico rendition of Villa Gamboria and Fiesole, and the lower one is my summary of the Getty Center landscape as I had been developing as I could remember it on the plane. In the meeting, I passed it around and explained the Renaissance concept of three natures, from the most domestic to an artificial, through utilitarian to wild nature, and of the analogies regarding the interrelationship between the spaces, the vegetation, the buildings, indoors and outdoors. They got it, and it allowed me to then walk them through the parts in the large drawings on the wall. Sometime later, I began to focus on one of the fountains for the Central Museum Courtyard. My first thought seen here in a watercolor from another sketchbook was that it would be nice to present several large natural rocks or boulders stone basin as a landscape composition. Maybe it would have, I don't know, mist or fog or water and then jets would flow somehow into a larger basin. Again, I shared the sketchbook with Meyer and the museum director who encouraged me to pursue it. Well, the basin rocks eventually were realized after an arduous process lasting many months searching for the right stones. We finally located a trove of rocks that I was satisfied with in the foothills of the Sierras near Yosemite and Sutter's Mill where gold had first been discovered and it led to the gold rush of 1849. These rocks had been pulled out of a pile of rubble in the woods near one of the very early mines. And you can see me in this photograph on the left, book about the rocks that I found to be the most interesting and the most suitable. A colleague helped me, you can see him in the foreground, Dennis Hickok, helped me measure their size and general dimensions, which I recorded in a sketchbook. Well, after this session in the stone yard, I began working in that same sketchbook with the field notes while I was flying back to Los Angeles from Sacramento. On these four pages, you can see me trying to figure out several arrangements, in particular, arranging the ensemble around two versions of several of the major stones, as well as the relationship of one stone in particular to the circular boundary down there on the bottom. Well, 
Working from these notes, we selected the stones I wanted. We returned to the woods near Columbia and we arranged them as drawn in one of my last sketches. We created a full-size mock-up with plastic sheeting, plywood, and water of the major features of the fountain, not all the stones, but the major topics, which despite a storm when we brought the Getty Foundation officers, the museum director and the contractor up to see it, I was terrified. They, we, it was a terrible day, it was raining. I thought this is really not going well. But to my immense relief, they approved of the arrangement when I took them there. They said, oh, wow, this is cool. So I got away with that. So then we had to pack them up and ship them down to Los Angeles and working from my sketches and notes, and some key dimensions that we made from the mock-up, the stones were installed as per the sketch, which actually served as the working drawings that it would have been foolish to try and document it in any other way than that. And so here's the fountain and its landscape of stone, which was built remarkably close to one of the sketches that I'd made on the plane. Now this fountain is a commentary on the transformation, you know, of, of raw material of, 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 into art, as in this case, California marble, which is not dissimilar from the travertine of Myers buildings or the marble used by sculptors for centuries. It's a piece of the natural world, particular to the region, however. Such boulders are part of the rubble, as I just showed you, the, the overburden that was stripped away by miners and the gold bearing sands and gravels up there in the mountains. And, and they're part of California's history of settlement. So this design is also, it's a commentary on the transformation of ideas from drawings into physical materials and construction as well. Note the relationship of the two stones at five and six o'clock in the drawing and how they're in almost exactly the same place in relationship in the installation of the real thing, both the sketch ones and the more finished studies that we make from designs. Well, we use drawings at every stage of a project, whether we're developing schematic design as here in a cross section representing structure, planting and program activities. The most useful drawings since Egyptian times have always been the plan and the section. You know, architects have elevations, but we don't have, there is no elevation of a landscape, but there's sections, lots of them. And simply because they're to scale, everything has dimension and every is in the exact relationship vertically and horizontally to everything else. There's no fudging or full thinking, just the facts and the relationships. As implied earlier, it's not that we don't need and use computers in our office on projects. We do a lot with both simple ordinary programs as well as some really sophisticated ones with large printers that go pretty constantly. But these are not exclusively used for production you know, and the steady production of promotion materials. Here's a person who has scanned a freehand design sketch and is translating it into a digital version, rather the way Frank Gehry and his employees scan their study models and then they create digital drawings and then they rework the models. And they... Well, as landscape architects, we find the size of computer screens to be terribly limiting and at times useless. Frankly, we inevitably find that we need to print things out at scales where we can actually see what we're doing and see things. In the case you see here, the site was 150 acres. And unlike buildings, they're, they're relatively small and can normally be seen whole or in large portions on a computer. So we work with drawings, whatever size is required to feel and understand things. Commonly in the concept phase, of design study for many things, such as this project for an update of a humble bench, we make full-size drawings prior to building mock-ups and going into final documentation. And here are examples where we've gone from small freehand drawings to larger computer ones. Then we've come back and made corrections and improvements by hand over the digital ones. So there's an iterative process now between the hand drawings and the computer drawings. Another example of this interplay between computer and freehand is my critique that you see here of a draft Photoshop perspective made simply in pencil, explaining how to make the digital view better, how to purge 
the for hire from Shanghai or Shenzhen character common to a majority of architectural renderings today that invariably have too much detail and sharp focus at inappropriate distances. Too much chroma, colors were too bright. They result in brittle and rather nasty qualities, many of these computer renderings with stock figures and thinner generic details. The subsequent computer drawing rendering produced by one of our staff is lovely, but it still has several of the faults common to computer drawings. It's that the softer gestural, less complete and less precise analog drawings don't suffer from. Now, one reason for such work can be seen in this architecture office I visited in Chicago. It's a portrait of a factory in an industry. They make buildings, not widgets, but they're I didn't see a single drawing board, nowhere. When it was, we tried to have a conference, they couldn't find paper. They're scrounging around to find tracing paper for me. I thought it was pathetic. On the right is our office, our office. It's somewhat different as you'll see. It clearly isn't much of a factory, nor is it organized around some sort of idea about efficiency and maximum use of employees per square foot. It's a design studio. Make no mistake, Neither I nor my partners would argue against the use of current technology. We're not Luddites. Computers are fabulous tools like telephones and nail guns. The whole point of the talk has been to argue for the efficacy of drawing as a different and remarkably useful tool for designers, for their education, for their work. Nothing since we came out of the caves has proved better at helping us capture a fleeting thought about physical reality and nothing since the development of paper, pen, and pencils has been more useful and flexible, regardless of the personality and ideas of using them. We have a group of very tech-savvy people, but we also have oodles of pencils and paper and numbers of places to work, places to concentrate, places to work communally, collaboratively. Drawing, of course, can also be a very important solo activity where an individual simply explores ideas and their implications quietly. This doodle in the middle down there was one of many for the site designs of the status center at MIT, which we did with Frank Gehry. That we work this way has not escaped the attention of our colleagues. Not long ago, as we were preparing a presentation for the Philadelphia Museum of Arts master plan, that we'd been working on for several years with Frank Gehry's office. Frank called me up and said, hey, Lori, can you do one of those big, nice hand-colored drawings that you make of the plan? So we did, and here it is blown up the size of a wall. There has been a fair amount of talk in recent years about the death of drawing and a certain amount of triumphalism regarding the magic of computer modeling and algorithms of visualization, animation, and fly-throughs and that sort of thing. For many students and younger designers, I b a belief has developed that hand drawing is eh, passe and not worth doing. Sadly for them, it seems true. I say sadly, not because they'll be unemployable, they will probably get jobs of some sort, but because I have doubts about how not being able to draw will limit their design ability and ultimately their engagement with the real world and the effect upon our built environment from the work and products that they make and their ability to satisfy our innate desire for aesthetic pleasure in the world of our making. On the other hand, in my last years of teaching at Penn, I found a great number of our students were eager to take drawing courses and use hand drawing on field trips and in their studio work. I'm confident that wherever they go or whatever they end up doing, this is a skill they'll be glad they have and it will give them pleasure. Finally, to close, in an unapologetic and self-serving moment, let me point out my two most recent books from Oro Press, Be Seated on the left and France Sketchbooks on the right, which present a number of my thoughts on drawing. The first one is a history and discussion of public seating in the West with numerous examples, including many from our own office. Uh, the second one is a record of drawings that I've made in France over a period of 50 years that show a design, how a designer like looks at places and things and learns from the world around them by taking the time to look carefully, to slow down and to draw it. So I guess, you know, Desenio 
uh, is an Italian word, and it means design. It also, in Italian, means drawing. I think it means design and drawing both for a very good reason. Thank you very much. That's it. And now stop share, right? Ta-da. There we go. Hi. Are we back? Hi, guys. Hello. What would you like me to do next? Turn off something. Stop. Oh, you can you just clap. That was that was <laughs> breathtaking. Oh, th hey, thanks. Nice of you to. Oh, you. So now we're gonna take it to okay. the questions cool. yeah, no, I'm, portion. I'm up for it. I can take this. it. <laughs> All right. Sometimes so it's impossible, but that's yeah. <laughs> about six o'clock so we've got about a half okay, hour to answer great, yeah. the questions yeah i didn't so if you all still have questions to ask stick those in the q a section of this meeting and we will get to as many as we can that's right i'm patient all right thanks so the first question we have is without travel how do you how do you find these drawing inspirations from home okay. Well, let me say that um, I learned to draw before I could travel. <laughs> and that part of how I learned to draw was by, as a child, I was copying comic strips and comic books. And then uh, I, I drew from illustrations and then I drew from photographs. And where I grew up, there were no museums. Uh, so I started drawing either from life, what was outside, you know, the trees, the birch trees around me and Fairbanks and, and the the boats on the river and stuff like that. So I, I drew what was outside, you know, the, the cultural landscape of, of my home, but also I learned an awful lot about drawing by copying drawings. And one of the things I did with my students, and I realized that people have done this for the last, for centuries, and that is uh, you, you often will to figure out how did Leonardo make that drawing? So you copy it. How did Van Gogh make that drawing? So you copy it. Your copies are maybe, stupid and maybe not very good but in the course of it you're learning how they made things how they made the shapes and where they decided to leave things out and so if if you can't here we are i'm showing pictures from france and we're all saying oh, i can't go anywhere it's COVID 19. <laughs> i have my students draw stuff around the house their you know their tennis shoes paper bags stuff in the kitchen then I have then I have them for a chair and draw it and they learn to draw by drawing. That's the only way you learn. So my advice to you, if you can't travel, doesn't matter. Most of my students travel when I'm having a drawing class. <laughs> okay. Hope that answers it. Get going. Just draw <laughs> everything. Thank you. Next. So yeah. our next question is, do you have experience with drawing an iPad? How do you feel about it? How do you feel using it as a design tool? Uh, my, what I, I'm not very good at that, and I haven't done much of it. I have had students who are pretty good at it and did some pretty good drawings with iPads. And there are some artists, you know, not just David Hockney, there, there are some other artists. Uh, there's a, a woman in Brooklyn who had a show at ICA in Boston recently that was fabulous stuff done with iPads. The problem I have with iPads is the texture, the feel. They still haven't. None of the drawing with styluses or anything on computers yet has got the feel of, of uh, moving a soft thing, across, whether it's a pen or whether it's a pencil or charcoal across different textures of, of surfaces of paper. So my experience is that it, you can get good line drawings and simple flat washes, but it's harder. And despite the programs, it's harder to get the, the vagueness or the the smudginess that you can get in a, in a hand drawing on with the traditional media. So I'm, I'm not an opposed. I just think they, they do, there's some effects that you can't feel with your hand. Um, the, the, you know, what do we call it? The hack. So keep trying. <laughs> Don't give up. All right. Our, our next question is, how do you find inspiration? What advice on finding inspiration can you give to others? Okay. Inspiration. Don't sit around waiting for it. The first thing, the 
when people in my office are stumped or when my students are stumped, I tell them do something, draw something and react to it. You get started. Uh, inspiration is something that happens while you're working on something usually. I mean, if, if it didn't come to you in the shower and you're sitting, which is one of the best places for thinking about stuff um, in the morning, um, I would say that inspiration, sometimes when I was stumped in the past, I had a book of uh, Japanese textiles and I would get it out and start turning the pages. And there's, they've thought of every pattern in the history you could possibly imagine. And so just turning a page after about a dozen or so, something happens, you're not, it's not one of them, but if you just start looking at patterns and certain things, you become impatient, the brain becomes impatient, doesn't want to keep doing that, it wants to go do something. And usually, so I would say you can, you know, randomly flip through stuff or you can do stuff, but just sitting around waiting for something to happen, it won't. You have to become active and engage the brain with something, whether it's doodling, whether it's pushing play around, or whether it's you know going for a walk, or whether but you have to be active and, and do something, and then you will get some ideas. Okay. Sitting still is the last way to get inspiration. They don't happen. But drawing and then hating the drawing, that's the first step. <laughs> you make something and you think this is terrible and you immediately know how to make it better. You, know, right? you start hacking at it and changing it, okay? All right. Our next question is, what tools are always in your bag when you're traveling or on the go? Uh, well, I usually travel with some colored pencils, a fair range of them, uh, with a fountain pen, a bottle of ink, you know, some pencils, you know, pencils and ink and pen, and, and then a sketchbook, at least, you know, at least a good sketchbook with decent paper, that's it. Well, you know, like everybody else, I have a phone that I can take pictures with, but, and send, but, but usually what I'll do is I'll draw something and take a picture of it with my phone and send the drawing. <laughs> so, okay, I hope that answers that one. Simple stuff. Prismacolor pencils, by the way, you know. A, a fair range of them. I, I used to be deeply attached to a couple of colors. Uh, you know, the 947 is a brown that we used to use for everything. You may have heard of. Um, sometimes we use black, but but the brown is more forgiving in some ways than black is when you're drawing. Thank you. Our next question is, how do you feel a design studio will be reimagined post pandemic? Well, uh, I think, I don't know. Uh, every, it's clear life will not be the same and we'll find new ways to do things. We've all gotten much more, whether we like it or not, we've gotten better at using things like this Zoom and, and that sort of thing. But it's hard to give a crit to somebody, a real desk crit over the, um, the, 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 this medium that we're using right now to talk on. Um, sometimes when I, our office, you know, right now, like everybody else, we're stretched out, all people are all over the place, and when someone will put up a drawing, and then someone else will take control of it and try and doodle on it, and then you find yourself saying, no, up in the upper left, no, 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 just to the right, and it's just very hard to give a crit to someone over the wire like this. It's much easier if you can sit next to the person, pick up a pencil, put something over the drawing, and start talking and drawing at the same time. It's the way crits have been given for seven, you know, a couple hundred years. And I think it, it's, there is, it is an unbelievably, uh, how to say, effective way of teaching. It's, it's uh, expensive, it's labor intensive, it's tiring, but there is no other form of teaching that is like the studio teaching that we've had traditionally. So after the pandemic, I think we'll probably find ourselves, if we're, all spaced out, you know, that's, that may go on for a few years, you know, we don't know how long this will last. So I think spatial separation is one thing, but I think we still have to have fairly close contact with a, a the ability to touch and move around with things. I, I just can't see us successfully having a, a good working relationship with the media we have right now. So some of, it'll be sort of like it was, but it'd be sort of, you know, and I can't tell you exactly how. I mean, the future is always 
kind of made out of pieces of the past with some changes. And you're, and you're always surprised which things go on no matter what, you know, some of the dumbest ones. You know, it's like little mammals were running around when there was, you know, at the ankles of the dinosaurs before they all disappeared. There were some of the first mammals that showed up. So the future is already here. We just don't quite exactly know which parts it is. Thank you. Based on what you want to communicate or what you prefer? Oh, it's a bit of both. Uh, sometimes it's kind of opportunistic. Um, there are times when you think the only way to explain something is A, you know, it's, it's, you, it needs to be big or it needs to be in color. There are other times when just a doodle is enough. Um, so I would say that it quite often has to do with opportunity. Uh, last week, I, I had to do some drawings for a project we're working on out in Los Angeles. And um, I printed out a something that uh, one of my staff had sent me that was a, a simple hard boiled computer drawing of a plan. And I thought to get people's interest, I make something that's attractive. <laughs> and so I put a piece of paper over it and did a very quick, quite loose, but rather lovely uh, soft pencil color drawing and then sent that back out to the people. And they were all like, oh, wow, this is great. And it gave me the power to push the drawing and the, direct, the design in the direction I wanted to go. But by putting out something, had I, I could have just sent them back a critique saying, well, you should move those two trees. I think these lawns need to be stretched and done a black and white drawing, but it wouldn't have had the power of the of this thing where I put the little shadows from the trees, you know, there's little the shadows were done in in a in a slight uh, light violet, and you know, and it, it just kind of had a nice touch to it, you know, and that really made a difference. So the I don't think I quite answered the question. How do I know what I want to do? It's intuitive, like many things, but it, I've been doing it so long. That's the problem. I I, I can't analyze it very well. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Our next question is, do you have any tips for people who are just learning how to draw? Uh, don't worry about the fact that it seems going slow <laughs> and some of the things you're doing may not be anywhere like what you'd like to be doing. Um, my first tip is try to be patient. Um, and if you draw something that doesn't work and you draw it again and you do the same way, you think, well, why should it get better if you keep doing the same thing? <laughs> you know? So so one of the things is to look at what you're doing and then say, well, what would I change to do the next thing? That would be one thing. But I think, um, you know, there are all these old things about learning, having to crawl and walk before you can fly. I think the notion that you're not going to be at the end of the process right away, you know, the problem is beginning stuff always looks like beginning stuff and it's kind of boring. Um, but those exercises lead to something. And so I would say the first thing I always have my students do is do contour drawing, outline drawings, you know, where the, what's the shape of something, you know, draw, draw the outlines and, and get them seeing linear edges, finding edges and seeing shapes. And then after we get them so that they're doing nice line drawings of things, then, then we introduce tones textures, tones, uh, and to start talking about light and, you know, dark sides and light sides and shadows and that sort of stuff. And, and you, you can just take it in steps. I mean, there are books about it, but <laughs> the books are all kind of hopeless. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, a book of how to ride a bicycle, you know, <laughs> it's like the only way to do it is get on the bike, right? And, and it's like books about swimming. Well, you have to get it in the water. And so drawing, the only way to get better is to draw and keep drawing. And and you will get better. You, the, people always do. It's really interesting. It's like, you, I can't teach you to draw, but you can learn how to draw. It's like language. Nobody teaches their one-year-old how to speak English or French or Taiwanese or whatever, but kids get it because they practice it all the time, trying to figure it out. And, and they're on the case all day, every day, because they want love, they want attention, they want food, they want to be picked up, they want something. And so they learn how to, they try after about two years, they're already speaking with full vocabulary. 
vocabulary, the right accent, you got the diction down, you know, because you've been practicing con well, clearly you can't draw all day every day. And people aren't going to give you food or love you or pick you up because you did a good drawing. So that's not, it's not the same. I know it. Uh, but but you have to do more than just a little bit now and then. You have to really do a lot of it. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> just just draw. You know, you know, it comes, but it takes a while. You know, two years from now you'll be better than you are now if you do it. It won't happen overnight. And so don't kind worry. Of along Everybody with... starts the same way. Go ahead. You got a long one. Oh, Go I'm ahead. sorry. Go ahead. So along with that, we have another question that says, um, what age did you begin to truly be inspired by drawing? I don't know. The word inspire may not fit into this very well because I, I just uh, started drawing when I was about, I don't know, three or something like that. And um, then I just drew all my life. I never stopped. Um, but I really, I, I, it really took off around second grade or third grade so I guess when I was about seven or eight um and I I, I don't know it just it seems so wonderful and powerful you know I could draw Dick Tracy you know I could make Mickey Mouse you know the the power you have of of taking a piece of chalk you borrowed from the classroom and going out on the sidewalk and showing your classmates want to see Donald Duck <laughs> drawing Donald Duck you know there was like this power you know of the pencil right so I guess maybe that's it. <laughs> Sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? It's also quite believable. All right, so the next question is, what advice would you give students entering the profession of landscape architecture? Uh, entering the, you mean leaving, leaving home in the college and going into the profession? Or just coming in. Well, I would say, uh, what advice would I give? Um, try and uh, travel when you, we finally are all less grounded, and and you can go see stuff, go see the world, and see as much as you can, and uh, and read as much as you can. Uh, you can, you'll never know too much. That's not going to be the problem. <laughs> so you'll never see too much. That will be the problem. Um, and then uh, a professor gave me a piece of advice when I was graduating from architecture school. I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. He said, well, if you don't become a cartoonist, which you'd be pretty good at, but <laughs> if you're absolutely going to try and do this architecture stuff, um, I think you should go and go to find one of the best people who you think is one of the best people who's practicing and go try to get next to him, get a job there and spend some time and learn as much as you can from one of the people you think is really good. And then he said, oh yeah, but let's see, Frank Lloyd Wright's dead and Gropius is dead and Alto is falling apart and drinking too much and hmm, Mises is dead. Well, I guess you can't go find the great men. So you and go to a great place. <laughs> he said, you know, uh, Paris, London, Rome, New York. The, these places have always seemed to be stimulating to young designers and artists. Go to a place that's always been stimulating and see if you can take it for a year or two. You don't have to stay there, but go get stimulated. You know, So my advice to a young, person entering the field is go find someone who you think is doing good work and try and work there. And then uh, try and see as much as you can, read as much as you can. Don't worry about fashion and what's going on right now. Follow your own instincts, you know. We all know what's wrong with the world, right? So you, you can work on it in lots of ways. Hmm? There, there is not one path. It's kind of like the Tao of landscape architecture. All ways are the way. You know? so, Okay. All right. Our next question is, have you ever come across a community of people or um, coworkers who absolutely hated your ideas for a park or landscape design? Yes. And if so, what do you do <laughs> to try and appease them or uh, reach a middle ground with them? Well, that's a good question. Um, I have been defeated on some projects and had them not happen because of that. I've also not been hired on a couple of occasions because people didn't like the, the way I sounded or what they thought I stood for or was going to do for them. Um, but if you're in a project, you're working on a project and you're getting resistance at a certain point and you are not interested in following the opposing criticism, if you think the criticism is wrong or will wreck the scheme or you absolutely think they're crazy, 
then you have to find a way of trying to deal with it, which is what I think the question is getting at. And in this case, trying to figure out how to tell people no, or how to give them credence and, and accept them as being a valid person, but that you don't think that what they want to do, you will do, and you give them a reason. The first thing to do is listen to them, appreciate them and say, well, I can see how you would feel that way. I, I understand that that's a possible point of view. Yeah. But I don't actually agree with that. As you, and let me explain why. And let's, let's talk about it. But you know, I'm, it's not, it's not a foolish point of view, but I don't agree with it. Let's, let's go deal with that. <laughs> and at least then you've given them standing they exist. You haven't just dismissed them as being foolish or stupid or beneath your dignity or something. You know, you have to give people the credit for, for having thoughts and care and opinions, but then you have to try and help educate them if you really do have a better idea. Sometimes people who argue with me have a good idea. <laughs> you know, that, that's part of the listening, learning to listen to people. Sometimes, you know, I'll be doing something that you know, it, it, I want to do it. It's a good idea, but there are other ways to do things too. Sometimes there is more than one way to get a good scheme. And the other scheme might not be what you would have done first, but hey, this is a pretty good scheme too. And you could do that. So it depends on the situation, the person, how really wound up they are and how, and what level of importance it is. Is it a detail not worth falling on your sword about, or is it worth quitting and saying, that's it, I'm out of here. You know, there usually is somewhere in between. Patience, listening, and then finding how to give somebody credence while disagreeing with them and going on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Our next question is, have you returned to the Getty Center recently? And if so, does it make you, how does it make you feel? I haven't. I haven't been there for a couple of years, um, but uh, generally the last time I was there, Michael Van Valkenberger and I were there and we were walking around and I felt pretty darn good. I, I, I was very pleased with it. There's a couple of parts that uh, had been changed by some of their uh, staff and horticulturalists because a couple of things we did, you know, their life was over or they, they just weren't quite working out. Not important stuff, but uh, th then there was a one area that I think needed needs re refreshing, needs needs uh, replenishing and redoing. Uh, that's the cactus garden. It was looking kind of tired, and um, so you know there there are things about the scheme that I think were wonderful, but that they, also it's grown beautifully and it's done very well. I'm very pleased with it. People love it, but there are also things that you know that needs attention. <laughs> And, and, but they've done a really good job. I mean, if, if you don't like that job, it's my fault. It's not the client or some, you know, we didn't have enough money or somebody was mean to us. <laughs> okay. It is wonderful to a site that hasn't been screwed. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's great. Makes you feel great, especially when you see people enjoying it and using it. Thank you. Our next question is another one about drawing. It's, do you have any suggestions for learning to draw more accurate depictions of spaces? And what is your self-learning process for depicting things in space? Uh, well, uh, how do I explain? Okay. Uh, in, how to depict a space? Uh, they usually have some boundaries and edge, but there's, I always start with a horizon. You know, where is my eye? Am I up in the air? Am I on the ground? So where is the horizon? And then um, let's just say, for instance, it's a, it's a relatively even slope or flat space, flat-ish space. Of course, landscapes aren't really flat and shouldn't be, they won't drain, but anyway. But let's propose it's a window or something. Um, if I figure out the horizon is, I put a person, people will be hanging off it like clothespins. <laughs> There'll be a big clothespin in the foreground and off in the distance will be a little one because, and that tells me where the ground is. And it also gives me depth. Um, I quite often use people in drawings to help show distance and uh, scale. Um, and if, it's, uh, if I don't, 
Well, then you find something else like trees or, or automobiles or something else. Um, you you want to find something that will give scale, so you can so you can actually read distance, depth, and width. You know, so so that so that the horizon is one thing you must always know where it is uh, in your drawing, and then the boundaries. You know, what what is shaping the space? What gives it? Is 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 the sun coming from the left, and are there shadows moving across? Is the one side darker and one side lighter? So there is this whole ambiance of the things that define space space has no anything space is just nothing it's just right it's just it's there and the only way we know about space is the things that that uh light falls on that shows us its limits its edges right so top floor ceiling sides mountains stream canyon bottom you know whatever buildings going down the street so drawing space spaces uh, you're really not drawing the space. What you're drawing is you're drawing the things that that delimit it, that show you where it is, or where it starts and stops. Huh? Okay. I think that maybe does it. <laughs> I hope. I hope yeah. it helps. <laughs> and how do I do it? Well, that's how I do it. You know, I, I just try and I'm, I'm looking. In, I live in a loft. I'm looking down the the length of the loft from where I'm sitting right now, and and what I see is I see. Uh, some chairs going off into space, like chessmen on a board, you know, and they're going chunk, chunk, chunk off into the distance. And if I were to do the drawing, I'd draw this one chair closer, bigger, and then a little further away, this little chair, you know, and then way off in the distance, a tiny chair, you know, and, and immediately the eye would know that the space goes all the way to that back chair, you know. But I haven't drawn space, I've just drawn the things in it, okay? Thank you. Sure. The next question is, have you ever had a client who did not want to buy into the time that it takes to do hand drawings for designs? And if so, how did you handle that situation? Well, they don't know when I'm drawing by hand or not usually. <laughs> um, no, they, the, you put in a lot of time that people don't know about. And you do things, I mean, they, they usually aren't watching you do your work. Um, but they, I, I will say over the last, you know, 50, 60 years, I've never seen a client that wasn't intrigued by the fact I could draw and they love it. They, they are totally intrigued by the fact that if you sit in a meeting and start drawing for them, or if you're working on it, they're across the table and you start writing upside down so that they can read it, they're just like, wow, you know, they just, they really love that. You know, they, they, it's, it's a cheap trick, which I didn't think of it as a trick when I first did it the first few times and I realized oh hey people really like they like to watch you do it it's like uh, it's like this magic you know and um, so I haven't found I mean in the office uh, you know we we sometimes do drawings that take too long but you know then we just don't bill for all that time you know it's just oh well we have to do that you know it's good we did it for ourselves as much as, but um, it pays its dividends you find a way to kind of handle it um, the computers take forever. I mean, they're, they're, it's not that they're so much faster. Uh, I mean, good God, look how much time people go down a rabbit hole trying to get computers to do stuff. Um, especially the renderings, my God, they take forever. It's much faster to do hand drawings for perspectives. Um, you know, like an infinitely less time, but, um, but it's a different look and a different feel and, and it depends, but um, the big, those big hand rendered plans those do take a while they they can be <laughs> that's why you want help you know it's quite often using more than one person to do them get them done um but we no we've never had much problem with that uh that's not an issue because they're not in your office seeing how you're doing it usually thank you mm -hmm. our next question is what are your favorite books related to landscape architecture Oh, that's tough. Uh, it depends. It all depends on what I'm trying to figure out or want to know. My favorite books. Well, um, what to say? If you're interested in learning about the history uh, of what's been done, where, and it's a good history, I would say Betsy Barlow Rogers' book, 
whatever its title is, is as good as we have right now as a compendium of all the, the history of landscape architecture and most continents. Um, when I was younger, I found uh, there were some interesting books, but it, there really wasn't anything. One of the reasons I ended up writing things was I couldn't find stuff that was I liked. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I think books about particular designers are, are great. I mean, a, a good book about Burley Marx, a good book about Olmsted, a good book about, you know, Halprin or something. It's, it's having a good study about somebody who did good work and there's plans and there's photographs. Those are really good. There's a nice biography, autobiography of Larry Halpern, for instance. Sketch, those are terrific. Um, there, there's not a really, there's a couple of books about Dan Kiley, but they're not very good. I mean, they're okay, you know, but uh, they don't give you Dan. <laughs> and there's a, Thaisa Way did a nice book about Rich Haig. But I would say some of the, Jeffrey Jellicoe wrote some papers years ago that were really pretty good and uh, kind of nice. I liked those. But, you know, I have a library in the next room. I mean, we have an office library, which I didn't show you guys, but it has thousands of books. <laughs> and there's books on plants, books on cities, books on architecture, books on planning. And then there's all the monographs about everybody, you know, there's, you know, everybody's in there. Um, there's Pete Walker and there's, you know, Martha and there's Fred, Fred Dick Olmstead and there's Jens Jensen and all, everything. it's all there, but there isn't one book and that's the problem. But so you want to start just picking up things. There's a couple of nice J.B. Jackson books that I think you'd really love to read. Um, and there's a new biography of him that's rather nice too. Uh, my favorite book, I don't know. One of my favorite books was a book I had when I was a child. <laughs> it was called Tree in the Trail by Holling C. Holling. It was a story of a cottonwood tree in the desert Southwest. And, you know, there, and uh, there are some children's books that are actually very good about landscape, oddly enough. <laughs> I mean, his book, Men of the Mississippi, not bad. Paddle to the Sea, not bad. There's a series of really great children's books that really are ecologically uh, uh, sensible with beautiful drawings. Um, but for grown-ups, we don't seem to have a lot of great stuff. I mean, uh, what can I say? It's tough. This is why you should all go out and do good work and then write a good book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, our next question. We've mm -hmm. got about three minutes left. Okay, so great. Maybe one or two questions left. Yeah, we'll squeeze them in. Yeah. Our next one is, can you tell a favorite story about your time in Rome at the American Academy? <laughs> oh, well, my, a favorite story. I'll just say that the, the best thing was being able to just go to the sites with archeologists and historians and just, wander around in the ruins and kind of try and figure out, oh my gosh, Hadrian's Villa, for instance, it's a, it's a mind blower. And you realize, oh, these guys, they were unafraid. They, they would, they'd say the hill's too small, so we'll just build more hill, you know? And so they just build some more of it, you know? <laughs> and then, then build on top of it. And, and the notion that architecture and landscape for them was all one thing. And I thought that was really the big discovery for me uh, especially in the case of now that it's become ruins, so much of it is all one thing very much. Um, I, I, I realized at some point I was talking a little bit too much about the academy. That the thing is not everybody's going to go and everybody shouldn't and don't worry about it. I didn't go. I had a lot of life before and I've had a lot of life after and a lot of great people didn't go. Larry Halpern never went. Dan Kiley never went. You know, Burley Marks never went. A lot of good, you know, um, People like Michael Van Valkenburg didn't get there until they were asked to be a resident when they already had turned into whoever they're going to become. So, so you, you can be a perfectly reasonable, wonderful, brilliant person without going there. But if you get a chance to go, don't miss it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great thing to do. Um, I would say that just walking around the city was an education, period. You know? That's my favorite story is go <laughs> and just have your mind blown by so much stuff, you know, and you think, oh, the thing when you realize that uh, they took ordinary things and turned them into celebrations for pleasure, for instance, all those fountains that we think are so amazing. Um, 
they're show off pieces by wealthy people for the the lower classes, no question about it. But those began as the idea was just a well to go get water to take home to cook with and wash and, and use for your household stuff. It was a place to get safe, fresh water. And everybody went there, there with buckets and they were pretty rudimentary things, kind of like a farm pump. But then people said, well, okay, we've got this thing and we could do something with it. You know, it's like, it's like when they decided they didn't want to get wet all the time and be in the sun all the time, the notion of doing porches and then the porches got more interesting and then they became arcades. You know, the notion of taking ordinary things and that, that, that touch your life every day that have a basic purpose is pretty rudimentary, but then turning it into art, that's what I learned in Rome. I was like, oh, wow, ordinary things could be very life enhancing. Yeah. So that's the story I learned in the room. <laughs> Do we have time for one more or not? Time's up. I think our time is up. Maybe we can do one more I'll, quick one. I'll, tr I'll try and be quick. It's, I'm the one who's not quick. Go ahead. You've got great advice, though. Right, okay, so our last one is, how much influence and inspiration do you find from comic books? <laughs> Well, they were a huge influence on me for, from, I would say, age four or five uh, through mm, high school, at least, and into college. And I actually worked for the Campus Humor Mag for, until it was banned by the university um, as a cartoonist. Um, I, I, I loved them, and I, there's only a couple left that are any good, um, you know, but... Uh, I thought Pogo was one of the funniest things ever. Mad Magazine, when it was still an early comic book, was just great. It, it later became a sort of adult satire magazine, but it, its early crazy surrealist days were wonderful. You know? anyway. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you for joining us today. Yes. You're welcome. Taking the time out of your evening to join us on this day of our lecture series. Uh, I also want to thank all the participants we had. We had about 200 today, which is oh, really wow. exciting. Holy smoke. I know. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. So uh, thank you to the participants. And thank you, Lori. Um, we hope to see everybody again in two weeks on February 22nd for our next speaker, Andrea Cochran. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lori, once again. And have a good evening, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Lori. Uh, uh, hey, Lori. Yeah? I was going to type this in, but I was going to take too long. Um, what? What? My, fav my favorite comic book writer slash cartoonist recently published her autobiography and memoir Ooh. all in comics and cartoons. Oh, really? Her name is Noelle Stevenson. Okay, I'll look her up. I read it and it was both delightful to read and it was truly amazing to uh, just w look at her work. Uh huh. I'll check it out. I was very depressed when Sam Watterson, you know, the guy retired and there's, there's a thought he might come back and do something again. Also when the guy who, what's his name, who did, uh, the guy from Seattle who drew the cows. <laughs> oh God, he was so funny. Oh. Gary Larson. Those people really were hilarious. Okay, what's your name again? It's uh, Gibson. Gibson. Oh, sorry, her name. <laughs> her name. It's um, Noelle Stevenson. Okay, I'll look her up. Thank you. Yeah, I thought you might just appreciate it. Sure, sure. Okay, guys. Bye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. <laughs>